You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Peter Kleins on the show with me today. Peter is one of my favorite authors. Uh, you know, Peter's one of those guys that when he has a new book release, it's on my auto buy. And uh, I'm just super happy to talk with him today. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thanks. Welcome for having me. Yeah. Welcome. For, thanks for having me. <laughs> welcome uh, to your show. Welcome to <laughs> Well, thanks, Peter. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and uh, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, this, this is going to be one of those really arrogant, like, pretentious things, and, I, and I've said this to people before because I honestly can't remember a point when I didn't want to be a storyteller. Um, one of my very, very earliest memories just flat out earliest memories. I think I was maybe four or five years old. Uh, I grew up in New England and I was on the beach. Uh, I had actually sprained my ankle. So my ankle was wrapped up, but you know, we went to the beach anyway and I got to sit and watch all the other kids play in the sand. And I ended up making up this story for a friend of mine, Todd, his dad was there too. Cause it was, it was the seventies. So, you know, like, Oh, one parent sort of randomly gets assigned to watching the kids and everyone else just, you know, crashes on the beach, all the other parents. <laughs> and so Todd's dad was watching everyone and I had to like sit on the shore with him while everyone else played in the water. And so I started telling the story about G.I. Joe, which when I was a kid, it was like G.I. Joe's last gasp as a big action figure before he went over me, came like sort of the classic G.I. Joe's we all think of now, the action figures. Um, and I was telling this whole extended story about how GI Joe and bullet man and Mike power were fighting the intruders and how they came down from space with rocks. And there were like a million of them. And so GI Joe shot one with his gun and Mike power kicked one with his bionic leg and punched another one. And bullet man used his finger rays to, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was it. It was just me babbling on and on. And one of the things I remember was I had made this big point that there were like a million of them. And then I kept saying, like, and they got rid of five and that was it. They were all gone. And Todd's dad be like, no. And I'm like, what? He's like, a million's a lot. There's still a bunch left. <laughs> oh, well, so uh, Mike Power punched another one. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I finally settled down, like, as this went on and on, like four or five times. And finally I was like, well, so Bullet Man just used his ray and got rid of the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's probably the first official Peter Klein story that ever existed. <laughs> that's hilarious. You know, that you say that, that it may seem pretentious to, to say that you've always been a writer. And, and that may be the fact on a lot of podcasts, but not on this one. That um, th th There are so many guests that I've had, uh, over 900 shows, that, that they're – you learn there's a pattern there that some people are just born storytellers. And, and I think there's, there's a gene um, that gets switched on or off. And, and some people are just born with the gene switched on. It, it seems like, um, do you, do you ever remember a time where you wanted to do something uh, in life other than uh, having to do a storytelling? I, I think when I was nine, I really wanted to be a giant robot pilot. Um, naturally and then <laughs> and i think i was maybe 11 when i discovered doctor who and decided i really wanted to be a time traveler um there i there was like weird points where like sort of other th other things would drift in but i think for me it just always on some level with storytelling yeah um you you may or not know i worked in the film industry for a while i did and so there were times when like i would sort of lean much more on the 
like telling stories that way. But yeah, I don't think there was ever a point when I think, okay, actually here's probably the better way to put it. There were brief points when I think when I just assumed I would have to do other things in addition to storytelling. But I don't think there was ever a point when I didn't think I, I, I thought I wouldn't be telling stories. It was just more of the sudden switch at some point in my life. Um, right around the time I think I was like 22, 23 and moved to California. It finally suddenly hit me that like this could actually be my my career, my living, that I could make money writing and not be a school teacher who wrote stories on the side or, you know, a an aerospace engineer who wrote stories on the side that I could just be a writer. Right. So. Yeah, that That's a, a really interesting um, point, because, uh, you know, as parents, we we talk to our kids and, and if if we notice something in them we we encourage them to to find a you know something that that they can lean back on while they pursue their art um my oldest son as a matter of fact is, is an english teacher now uh this going into his third year of teaching um and uh you know he's he's a writer he's uh, but I, you know i encouraged him to to do something that he loved that he could lean back on while he you know to to give him time to pursue that um w- I'm fascinated by this idea that kind of going for broke, um, you know, there's, I, I could do this for a living. What, what was it that, that, you know, caused that awakening in you that, uh, you know, that this is something that, that I could actually do what I love for a living. Um, I, I can tell you the, the exact, well, the, it's sort of a twofold thing of realizing I can do it for a living and then deciding to actually do it for a living. Right. And, and the realization moment actually came. Um, I had just moved to California, not just, I think I've been in California for six or seven months. Um, through a whole weird set of circumstances, I had ended up, and this is going to date me a little bit. Um, I had ended up submitting a script to deep space, Nine, the TV show. Okay. And, it, it had just sort of been an on a whim thing uh, that I was just like, eh, sure, whatever, okay. And I had, because I'd written a screenplay, wanted to do everything I could with it, found out how you could do this, sent it in, done. Um, sorry for the extra noise. I had something of a cat <laughs> rally going on around me. <laughs> um, and what happened was I, I sent it up to, I was living in San Diego at the time. I sent it up to LA, just sort of forgot about it. And then three months later, I think it was maybe four months, I came home from work and I had a message on dating myself again, had a message on my answering machine (laughs) uh, telling me that Ron Moore wanted to meet me and wanted me to come in to talk at Deep Space Nine. And so I had this frantic weekend of trying to come up with other story ideas. So I didn't go in with just the one story that I had sent in. And I remember a friend of mine who I had moved to California with was sort of taking care of me because I was so frantic. Like at one point she was like, have you eaten like today? And I was like, no. And she took me out to, uh, I don't even know if it's still there, but there was a, a TGI Fridays in La Jolla and she took me out to it and we were sitting there and I just had like a legal pad and I was just scribbling down like every Star Trek related idea I could think of and trying to filter it through Deep Space Nine. And it suddenly hit me at one point as I was doing all this and I was thinking I'm going to be going up and I'm going to be talking to him. It's like, wait a minute. It's like if they buy scripts, I think at the time a, a one hour TV script, the minimum was like $80,000. Wow. And I was like, this, this would change everything. Like this would that's like at at that time in my life, like that's like three years pay in one afternoon. Right. If, if they bought this and it suddenly hit me like all along, this had just been a fun thing. It had been a, I, I came up with a clever idea and I just wanted to see what happened with it. And suddenly I'm going to deep space nine. And, uh, and right there, I remember that sitting in, in that TGI Fridays 
and having this sudden realization of holy crap, like I could actually do this for a living. This could be my my primary income. So did did something in your brain change um uh when that realization came because for a lot of people you know that's the the culmination of of what we'd been working for um but for some people who you know have been doing this kind of on the side and it's um it it's a hobby when when that hobby becomes the thing um it takes all the fun out of it for you um what did you think how did your brain change when when the when the switch is flipped you know that this is this is this can be a reality this can be what i what i do this can be who peter kleins is um but was there a, a a fundamental shift for you in that moment it actually became kind of nerve-wracking for me because suddenly um i mean i i grew up in new england very strong new england roots that kind of quasi puritan mindset that you have to have a job a real job and you know and so this whole idea that like wait i i could be one of those people you hear about who makes money writing like that other guy from maine what's his name who writes books <laughs> never heard um, of him yeah some some guy yeah. prince something <laughs> um, <laughs> no but that was it i mean i that's kind of an all fairness thing i had grown up like in the, the shadow of stephen king that growing up as a kid in Maine, my mom, like, oh, my God, it's this writer from Maine. Maine has writers. It's a, And it seemed like this sort of mythical thing almost that, like, you know, well, there are fables of people who have made living as a writer. But um, so when I suddenly realized this, this was like an actual thing that could happen to me, it was almost more terrifying than anything. Um, because this was a, a path I had never, ever considered that I, I love telling stories and I had like submitted to comics as kid, as a kid, I had written short stories and tried submitting those, but this sudden idea that like right there within my grasp was like, forget this being a side thing. This is a full on career, which was a thought that had just never, ever occurred to me. Um, it was just, it was more of a freak out moment than any sort of, ah, this is a, a fascinating development. Um, and I, and I know because of it, I was like nervous as hell when I went up and, and did meet with Ron Moore. Like, like, I think there's a lot of reasons other people would be nervous to get that. And for me, it was literally just this whole idea that I, this was something I had never, ever considered. So what so, came, so what came of the meeting uh, with Ron Moore? Honestly, not much of anything. Uh, <laughs> he, he was really, it was funny because I went up and I found out after the fact he is notoriously, uh, or was, I don't know if he still is, I shouldn't say that, but apparently he had a, a he had at least a phase that may still be going of being <laughs> notoriously harsh to people who pitched to him. Oh, no. And I, I from what I've heard from many people and all, I, including uh, his wife, which is a whole weird thing that I kind of met his wife once in a weird side thing. But uh, he was apparently very impressed with me because I know one thing I walked in and he sat down and I've heard that he even had like an hourglass he would put out for like <laughs> one minute to get my attention. <laughs> and stuff like that. So I walked out and he's just sort of looking at his thing and he's like, so how'd you end up here today? And I am so frazzled and there's so much going on in my head um, that I actually, okay, I need, can I give you a small setup for this? Absolutely. I don't want to babble too much, but no, go so, right ahead. Um, I, like I said, I was living in San Diego. I'd been in San Diego for about a year and a half at this point. I had never been to Los Angeles, even though it was only like an hour and a half, two hours North. Um, the very, very first time I ever went to Los Angeles, the first time my foot touched the ground in Los Angeles was getting out of my car on the Paramount lot to go talk to Ron Moore. Um, so I drove up there. I was nervous as hell the whole, you know, the whole way, mostly because like, I have no idea where I'm going. 
Right. I had a couple film industry friends. I was working on a film in, uh, show in San Diego. We were like, yeah, it's super easy to get to Paramount. Just go this way, this way, this way. But I was, I'm going to miss an exit. I'm going to miss something. Uh, so I got up there. I got there like 15 minutes early, found the building, walk in, talk to his assistant. I'm sitting here like sort of waiting for my moment. And I just remember at one point, uh, Iris Stephen Bear walked in to talk to the assistant and kind of looked at me, gave me a little nod, you know, just random guy sitting there. And she's like, oh, this is Peter. He's here to pitch to Ron. He's like, oh, hey, he shakes my hand. And I'm like, oh, hey. And I suddenly like was sitting there and it suddenly all slammed down on me of like, oh, my God, I'm in Los Angeles on the Paramount lot sitting in Ron Moore's office waiting to talk to Ron Moore about a script I wrote with and and I was just suddenly drenched in like terror sweat <laughs> <laughs> and and I was just convinced that like the two of them sitting here just chatting about I, I don't even know what they were talking about and they're like you smell fear it smells like fear <laughs> And right at this point is when Ron opens the door, like, hey, Peter, come on in. And, <laughs> and so he basically says to me, he sits down. And like I said, he's, he's apparently notoriously mean about this. And uh, he's like, so how'd you end up here today? And in my blind panic, I go, oh, well, I, I just took the, the five to the 101 because everyone said that was like the quickest route. And there was this dead silence. And then he laughed. He's like, no, I mean, like, how did you, how did you get the meeting? And I'm like, oh, oh, I, I wrote a script and I, I filled out the form and sent it in. And there's this moment and he's like, so, I mean, like you're, you send it into your agent, your agent got, you know, it's like, no, I used the, the form, the online form, uh, the release form and I sent it in. And he, and this was the first time he actually kind of looked up at me and he's like, so you just wrote a script, sent it in blind through, you know, with the release form, and you're sitting in my office now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I'm like, I'm still like in the back of my head. I'm convinced like I've done something wrong. I don't know what did I <laughs> um and did not realize at the time this happened like once a season. That, that, that someone would generally send in a script that got passed up, passed up, passed up, passed up to the point that it ended up on the executive producer's desk saying, you, you should read this and talk to this guy. Um, so he and I talked for like, I don't know, an hour maybe? I think it was half an hour. It, it felt like ages. Um, and then I left. And what I did not find out until later was he basically told them like, yeah, if this guy wants to come back in, let him. We'll talk to this guy whenever. And I found this out. I, I walked out convinced I'd blown it. Well, that was it. That was my big chance at success. Um, and then like three, four months later, I think I got a call from his assistant again. Like, hey, we haven't heard from you again. What's up? And I'm like, oh, I, I didn't realize I, I there was an option to come back. And she's like, yeah, do you have anything new? <laughs> yes. Yes, there's <laughs> always something new. I have many new ideas for your show. <laughs> um, and so I ended up going in, I pitched to Deep Space Nine a couple times, uh, and then I moved over and I pitched to Voyager a bunch of times. Um, and it was right around then as, as uh, I think one of the last times I pitched to Voyager that I realized I hadn't actually worked on a, a book in ages that I had been focusing so much on screenwriting for like, at this point, like five years. Yeah. That, and so I s sort of started switching back over to that and here we are. So what were you doing to make a living during this time? Because, you know, from one meeting to the next is like four months and, um, you know, Southern California is not the cheapest place to live. No, uh, you, what what were you doing to make ends meet while you know still pursuing this dream? I, I actually was working in the film industry. I was a prop master and assistant prop master on a, a bunch of your favorite TV shows and movies, which is a complete <laughs> lie because at least one of the things I, I worked on is noted as one of the worst movies of all time. So, <laughs> um, 
but I did a lot of like B level cult stuff. Yeah. Odds are if you're if you're somebody who watched like a lot of you know, USA up all night, uh, or rented rented that third shelf stuff at the video store. Right. Back when there were video stores, you've probably seen a lot of my stuff. Um uh, noteworthy stuff I worked on. Uh, I worked on a TV show called Silk Stockings for about four or five years. I remember that. Actually, about four years. Uh, I did a superhero TV show called Nightman. Oh, I remember that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did a, a horror comedy called Psycho Beach Party, um, which I'm actually in. If you ever see it, I'm the murderer. Whenever it's like just the the leather jacket and gloved hands. So I was the prop master, but I would also be the murderer to run some of the different like murder killing gags we were doing. Um, I worked on a show called Veronica Mars for one season. And uh, again, the, the, the noteworthy thing, like I said, one of the worst movies ever made. So they say I, I worked on carrot tops, chairman of the board. Um, <laughs> and it's, Really, it's actually kind of sad because the movie we made and the movie that ended up getting released were two very different things. Um, and it's honestly, a lot when it gets into yeah, editing. The it was editing, it was reshoots. Um, they had like whole things they cut out of it. Louis Anderson was originally in the movie, and they completely cut Louis Anderson out. Like every single bit of him. Uh, Scott Thompson Carrot Top gets so much crap, but he is the nicest guy. I've um, heard that. Yeah, he was such a pleasure to work with. The sh- the whole shoot was so much fun. Um, pr- I don't know. It was it was really sad to like do it. Everybody was having a lot of fun with it. Poured a lot of work and effort into it, and then you know the the movie that came out was not the movie any of us had worked on. It was kind of sad. I mean, I never, I never had any dreams that we were making like, you know, the next Oscar winner block box office smash, but we, we had made a, a totally passable, fun, goofy movie. And the, that was not, that was not what came out on the DVD. <laughs> right. Want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level? Give pro writing aid a try. Pro writing aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over-dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over-complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error-free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of Pro Writing Aid Premium. Pro Writing Aid. Check it out today. Peter, I think you and I are are pretty close in age. I think you're probably two years older than me. Um, but so I, you're 35? I'm sorry? So you're 35? I'm 30. <laughs> I, I'm actually 31. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I remember as a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s that uh, movies were a big, big deal to me and my friends. Uh, I remember watching Star Wars. Um, I I didn't know what it was before. I actually saw it at a drive-in theater with my parents um, in the first grade. And I, I remember that one day the play on the playground was one thing. And the next day, I, I remember it as, as, as there's a uh, a dividing line on the playground where the next day everyone was Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader. Um, and, and I remember watching Indiana Jones. I remember watching Jaws. Um, and and these these movies were events for us because 
you paid super close attention because there there was no cable, there was no Netflix. You couldn't rewatch the movie and look for things, and uh, so movies were an event uh, to to our generation. Um, do you feel like being a kid in in the seventies and eighties? Uh, fed into this love of movies and, and then, you know, later novels and kind of these, these epic scope things. Do you think being a kid in that time feeds into that somehow? I mean, I, I don't think it hurt. Definitely. <laughs> um, I mean, I think you can say that of any generation that we all had like this weird sort of confluence of, you know, this aspect, that aspect, that aspect that I think we, people in our generation grew up at this like weird, perfect time of, like you said, there were movies, but we didn't have video stores yet. I mean, I don't right. think I saw the first video store until I was, I say 16. Yeah. I was definitely a teenager when they came up. Yeah. So, you know, like the hell, I don't think I even saw Betamax. I, I saw Betamax when I was like 14, 15. I think that was the first time I ever saw like in person, an actual, video recorder uh but yeah we grew up at this weird little time of uh like you said movies or events it was a big thing to watch that same with tv you don't get to watch tv episodes you, you had to like this starts at seven o'clock on friday and that's it if you're not there watching it you miss it um and all the kids on the playground will know about it um comic books were still super cheap and very widely available Every spinner rack and uh, in yeah. every convenience store you could think of. Yeah, I, mean, I, grew, I grew up in a little tiny resort town in Maine, and I had. I was actually just talking with someone about this the other day. I think I had five comic book racks within, like, one at this store, three at this store, one at that store, all within like two of them within walking distance, or I should say four of the racks within walking distance. The other one we drove past on a pretty regular basis. So, you know, I had this great influx of material and a certain type of material that I think that might be another aspect of it that we, we got used to a certain style of storytelling. Um, so yeah, I think I just kind of locked into a lot of that. Um, I know I also had one aspect was that, I had an uncle, my mom was the oldest of her generation and her youngest brother was much younger than her and only a little bit older than me. So I got a lot of hand-me-down stuff from him, uh, which included books and started off with like Hardy Boys books, but then also rapidly went into like Edgar Rice Burroughs books and I think he tried to give me like a gore book at one point and then decided like, even, even as like he was like 16 and he was like, no, you shouldn't read that yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it was the, the time period we were in the, I don't know. I mean, obviously there was a lot wrong with the seventies and the early eighties. I also, at the same time, it was a feeling of a lot of hope for the future that we had this weird feeling like, man, if we can just not blow ourselves up, we're, we're going to pull this off, you know, that, that we, we're going to, we've got science, we've got this, we've got all this technology that's appearing out of nowhere, you know, the Atari 2600, look at this, um, look at those graphics. <laughs> you could have it home on your TV. <laughs> so, well, we were the generation that lived under the threat of total, a total global thermonuclear war, but we also had the space shuttle and, you know, yeah. the, the great stuff going on there. And uh, I remember watching shuttle launches over and over and over again and, you know, getting this sense of excitement and wonder and, and all of that, you know, while also living under the threat that the Russians were going to, you know, nuke us at any minute. It, it was a very strange time. It was. And, and I think... You know, again, it's I'm, I'm going to be very fascinated in another 20 years to see what the all these kids who are 10 right now. Yeah. With all the stuff going on with technology. With I mean, OK, we we're just saying like free, easy comics that, yeah, I could go down and drop my 40 cents and get the latest issue of ROM, the latest issue of Micronauts, whatever. 
But now there, there's like a guy I follow on Twitter who's actually putting up his comic book on his Twitter feed. Um, nice. Yeah, so you can just tune in every Wednesday. And look, here's here's the latest issue of... Uh, crap, I just blanked on the name of it. Oh, and I want to give him a plug. I might have to jump to Twitter real quick while we're talking. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'll so put you, <laughs> yeah, I'll put it in the show notes, too, to okay. make sure people but can anyway, click it. Um, yeah, I just... I, I think every generation has it. I think we lucked out and we got a certain... Uh, I don't know, what would you call it? A We got a certain dynamic. Matthew Smith, who writes Johnny Chaos. That's the guy. <laughs> um, and I think everyone does. I don't know if, if ours was any better or any worse. So, Well, let's uh let's switch over uh for just a minute you 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 were screenwriting uh you were working in the film industry and you realized that you you mentioned a few minutes ago that you hadn't worked on a novel in a while um when you kind of had that realization and and kind of got fired up for that again uh was that the x heroes series that that came out of that time no actually it wasn't uh this was about Man, this was like seven years before X Heroes. Um, it was actually I, I can pin this down for you too. I was working on a on a sci fi channel show called The Chronicle, and uh, I had gotten a new computer through Gateway and the cow spotted boxes. Yep, exactly. And through a whole weird delivery thing that somebody had to claim it, and I was kind of lucky this way. Because I was working, I was working a job where I worked like a thirteen-hour day every day. Um, so they actually delivered the Gateway computer to the film studio in San Diego, and then the studio brought it out to me on set, so I could keep it on my truck and then pack it in my car at the end. <laughs> um, but and we were working in Balboa Park. I remember that too because I, I remember I can't even remember like picture it in my head living it up. But that weekend, I spent the whole time like bringing my old porting everything off my old computer onto the new one. And this was back in the days when we didn't have any fancy cables or anything. You're just using like, you know, one CD CD ROM that you're moving back and forth again, or, or hell not even a CD ROM, like a floppy disk. But, uh, and one of the things I found was when I had first moved to California, I had started writing a book called the suffering map. And when everything happened with Deep Space Nine with Voyager, with actually another producer I worked with, I had done some stuff and gotten like small options for her, from her. Um, when all that started happening, I just sort of put it away, and it struck me that I had um, 300 pages of a book that I had written, and I had not even opened the document in five years. And right around that time, I think for the at the same pretty close to the same time I had a birthday and I think it was my mom or maybe my brother uh, sent me Stephen King's on writing just because I was a big Stephen King fan. It was the new Stephen King book. And I started reading through that and thinking of this and I said, you know what? This is kind of silly because I knew like if everyone tells you like the odds of succeeding in publishing are hard, it is 10 times harder for screenwriting. Um, and I knew this, I knew that like the odds are stacked against me here, super stacked against me. And I was like, I could literally make this. I know the math is going to be totally wrong. this. I could make this 10 times easier on myself to just go back to writing books. And so that was it. I remember right when the Chronicle ended, I decided to go back and it's like, I'm going to finish this book. And finished it, edited it, started shopping it around. Um, and then when nothing really happened with it, I started another book. Um, and then I was maybe a third of the way through that. And that was when I came up with the idea for X Heroes. And at that point, I had sold a couple short stories. Um, I was out of the film industry at that point and actually writing for a, a screenwriting magazine. And that was that. The the X Hero series. Um, I love the the idea of it, the premise behind it. Uh, and and there are a, a number of books in the series. It's it's a fantastic series. Um, but is there um, 
superheroes in prose um, are are kind of a difficult sell for a lot of people. Um, there have been several, you know, uh, instances where people have tried it and it didn't work. And, um, you know, the, the comics format is a great format for superheroes. And, and is it, is it that, um, that we're accustomed to seeing these types of characters in the comic format, or is it that people don't know how to properly write superheroes in prose. Why do we not see more of these types of prose books? I think, I think it's a twofold thing. I think one, you're right that we're just used to, uh, superheroes being a visual thing, whether it be comic books or cartoons, you know, animation, TV shows, movies at this point, as we're clearly seeing, there's a little bit of money to be made in that. But, uh, I think the other half of it, and this is a, a, personal philosophy thing. I think people get confused about what a superhero story is. I think we have, um, I think we all absorb stuff, obviously that like if, if you like mysteries and read a lot of mysteries, watch a lot of mysteries, you will start absorbing that. Okay. A lot of mysteries share this, 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 this element. You know, and we can we can argue back and forth on what they are, and obviously there are different subgenres of mystery, um, different horror movies. You know, slashers tend to work like, pardon me, tend to work like this. Uh, thrillers tend to work like this. Suspense stories tend to work like this. And I think a lot of us have absorbed this is how a superhero story works. I think what happens a lot with books is I think people confuse. A story with about people with superpowers with a superhero story. Um, like if you think of it, okay, H.G. Wells, The Invisible Man. Is it a superhero story? No. It's a guy with superpowers. Right. <laughs> what about Stephen King's Firestarter? Yeah, I, Girl I with your... superpowers. She's, she's basically got the human torch's powers. Exactly. Superhero story? No. Yeah. Um, and we can go on and on for this. I mean, um, you know, is Luke Skywalker a superhero? He can move things with his mind. I mean, there's tons of books of people with telepathy, telekinesis, you know, super strength, super speed. I mean, is The Adventures of Baron Munchausen a superhero movie? It's It's got people with super strength, people with super speed, you know. <laughs> Um, and I think that's what happens a lot. I think that's why a lot of superhero books, books, as in novels, kind of fall apart because they forget some of these or, or just haven't logged into some of these basic things that we've absorbed that these are elements of a superhero story. And I think when it sort of expands out and we have all this, you know, we literally go from 22 pages to 350 and by nature of that expansion and suddenly developing this, changing this, making room for that, um, we tend to drift away from the superhero thing. Right. Does any of that make sense? I yeah, don't... Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, um, like, I've actually, I've, I've talked about this a lot, like lists of like, Traits you can see in superhero things, traits you can see in superpowers things. I do think if you look at a lot of 90s attempts at superhero TV shows, superhero movies, this is why a lot of them flopped. That they they didn't want to do a superhero thing, and it leaned much more into a superpowers thing. Um, like, weird as it sounds... Uh, the old classic Bill Bixby, Lou Frigno, Incredible Hulk. Great show, award-winning show, formative show for a lot of us who are alive at the time, or even, you know, alive at the time. <laughs> we're kids at the time. Uh, and even probably for people past that, since it went into the syndication and all. But do you really think of that as a superhero show? Right. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, 
notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the Roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. It draws on tried-and-true, tested theory that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Man, uh, Peter, the um, the other books that you've written, uh, 14, Paradox Bound, Dead Moon, Terminus, um, while not uh, The Fold, um, not in this original series that you wrote, the, the X-Hero series, um, but they tend to straddle science fiction, fantasy, um, a, a number of genres. Um, in Is film... Uh, more forgiving when it comes to genre than than book writing is prose writing um you know we we think for 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 good or for ill um we think in terms of a bookstore or amazon uh because we we need to know where to place our book so that people can find it and 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 people browse the science fiction uh section and you know th does this book fall over here is it fantasy is it something completely hybrid and weird? Um, you know, do you is it something you even think about when you're writing books? So like, what kind of story is this, and and where will it fall in the store? Um, I'm I'm spoiled and very lucky that I've at least hit a point where I can just write. Um, yeah, I know a lot of my stuff, like you were saying, straddles this way that way. Um, and it has caused problems at points, but I tend not to think about it that much. Um, I think it's better to just write the story you want to write, you know, and if your story involves ninjas and androids and magic crystals and I don't know, hockey face killers, then that's hockey mask face killer, hockey face killers. What the hell is that? <laughs> um, it's got a whole face that looks like a skating rink. <laughs> um, it, it, whatever elements are in your story, I think you just need to write your story. Um, or light swords and telekinesis. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the end though, all this stuff becomes a marketing tool is really what it is. Like, like you were saying, that point, it's just about, okay, where does this need to go in the store? Um, I don't think, I think a lot with movies, once we have the book in hand, if the book is done well, I don't think a lot of people are going to be upset if, you know, we get 70, 80 pages in and suddenly find out, wait, this is a time travel novel, <laughs> you know, um, and the same with a movie. If we're watching a movie, we love that moment, you know, when we suddenly realize like, Wait, what the hell is this? I, I was talking with someone uh, last night about how Pirates of the Caribbean has that great moment. Like, you're suddenly like 30, 35 minutes in the movie, and it's like, oh, no, by the way, didn't we mention this is a ghost story? <laughs> um, which I think is fantastic, and I think we're much more forgiving of that. But I totally understand from the marketing point of view I need to be able to say, well, this book's mostly like a science fiction thing. It's mostly happy urban fantasy, you know. Um, I have talked with agents in the past before I got my own agent um, about, you know, oh, trying to pitch this, trying to pitch that, getting interest in that way. But I really think at the end, write your story and then worry about, like, what can you honestly call it? Like, again, I don't want to say, oh, what's that? Supernatural romance is hot right now? Why, yes, that's exactly what my book is. 
Um, but I also don't think there's nothing wrong with, you know, writing something like Terminus and then, okay, what are we calling this? Well, we're kind of calling it like a sci-fi horror novel, you know? Um, and if it, if people want to add little subgenres that on their own, but that's like an immediate thing that anyone can pick it up, read it, not feel cheated when potentially more supernaturalish things enter into it. I mean, there's always going to be somebody who gets really annoyed that what magic garbage, but yeah, but uh, I, I'm, I feel like I'm prattling again. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it's a weird place that a lot of authors find them, themselves in right now um, because publishing has changed drastically in the last 10 years, probably exponentially so in the last five years um, with the, the Kindle revolution that's happened and um, the ability to publish straight to the Kindle store and go directly to your audience, not go through a publisher. Um, and, and this is not a, about the, the merits or or, or, or demerits of one versus yeah. the other. But, the, but, the, it, but it is there. But it is there. And yeah. the reality for a lot of, uh, well, the reality is that a lot of authors get to choose now. And this was a, a choice that they never had before. But with that choice comes um, the other hat that you have to wear. And that's of a publisher and uh, publicist. And, uh, you know, that there's a business aspect of it that, yes, that some absolutely. writers don't have to deal with or, or we have the illusion they don't have to deal with. Um, I, I think that you always kind of have to worry about the business side of it, um, no matter what your publishing is like. Um, but this is this is something that that authors are having to think more and more about. Is, you know, when I write this, how am I going to sell this? How will people find me? What will you know, I can't just take every whim of fancy uh with this book i need to be more deliberate with this um do you do you feel those kind of sea changes in in publishing or or, or are these just constraints that that we find to put on ourselves because we want to avoid writing (laughs) i don't know i mean we can always find an excuse not to write we can (laughs) um it's funny you mentioned it there was a great uh a friend of mine Double shameless name drop here. A friend of mine, Jonathan Maybury, uh, told me this show thing. before. Okay, cool. And he actually mentioned once uh, this thing Richard Matheson had told him, which is writing is art, publishing is the business of selling as many copies of that art as possible. And I think when we want to write, like I was just saying, writing should be free. We shouldn't be worried about. You know, don't worry about the market. Don't worry about where it's going to sit in the bookshelf. Don't worry about, you know, whatever. Just write the story you want to write. You know, if you want to write spy thrillers, write spy thrillers. People say vampires aren't hot. You want to write a vampire story, write your vampire story. Um, Everybody says vampires aren't hot until a new vampire series completely breaks out. That's what happens again. (laughs) You know, pick, pick your XYZ. It's not hot until someone makes it hot again. Exactly. Um, so, you know, whatever you want to write, write, and then whatever path you choose when you're done, like I was saying, now start thinking about marketing, distribution, all that. Like, you know, my agent and I have talks about the fact of things I want to write. How will, how should we be talking about them? Like there's a, a weird Western idea I've wanted to write for a while and he's pointed out and I think rightly so weird Westerns are not generally a, a wide appeal thing. They're a, a, a cool, fun subgenre. There's definitely fans for them. There's definitely a market for them, but I don't think any of us really think of a weird Western as the thing that's going to top the New York times bestseller list. Um, and because of that, there are some publishers who just won't look at a weird Western. However, they might look at this piece of historical horror I've written. So true, true. Yeah, there is that. How how do we want to talk about something? There's also, like you were just saying, what whatever path you choose. If you want to go traditional press, you know, self publish, big press, small press, whatever. Um, 
I think one thing a lot of people forget when we get to that business side is it is business now. And we, you do need to start thinking about, you know, how is this going to be received? How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to sell it? Um, another friend of mine, a computer tech guy, Bo, we were talking about 3D printers a while back. And we're debating whether or not they're ever going to cap, like how much will they really cash on? I mean, I know some people have this idea that eventually everyone's going to have a 3d printer in their home that will just, you know, make things for them and it's going to kill the manufacturing business and blah, blah, blah. And Bo came up with a very neat point that 3d printers are great for the things there aren't much, there isn't much demand for that it's always going to be cheaper and easier to go to Staples or Target and buy a box of paper clips. Than to you make know, a box of paper clips. Or to make one paper clip. Right. You know, I've got a couple of friends who do 3D printing, and it's like, well, that's a 15-minute job. <laughs> make one paper clip. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Someone bumped the machine. All right, got to start over. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, but the thing it's going to be popular for, like, Bo is Bo is an automotive fan. He likes cars, and it's like, wow, I need to replace this interior panel for a nineteen eighty three Ford, you know, whatever. Um, that's what three D printers are awesome for, because there's not going to be a big demand for that. Obviously, Ford's not going to start putting them out. It's not worth it to anyone else. But if you can just download the specs for something like that and replace it immediately, if you want to look at toys, you know, the I don't think Hasbro has any plans to start, you know, making replacement parts for vintage 1960s G.I. Joes. But, hey, what's that? You can go on to Shapeways and here's how to make a helmet for that. I think self-publishing is a lot like that, that one of the cool things about it is if you have your weird Western, if you have your secret dinosaur Bigfoot love story, whatever. Um, yeah, it may not be something that a large publisher would like, but that is, it's a, there's still a valid avenue for you. And you can make money off it because you can find that audience. Um, but again, I don't think, I just don't think it's a good thing to, to think too much about that ahead of time. It's just when the time when the time comes, one way or another, you're going to have to think about it. But if, if you want to do this as a funny thing, if you just want to write the coolest dream journal ever uh, and just write, cool, power to you. Um, and you'll have a lot of fun and probably a lot less stress. But <laughs> right. so I'm babbling again. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know that. And if anyone out there is looking for a great weird Western, make me no grave by, uh, by Haley stone published by Athon books, it will blow your mind. That is um, actually, that has been sitting in my to read list for a while. So, Oh my God. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it will melt your brain. It's absolutely it? amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and the, uh, the Athon Books guys are, are very dear friends of mine, and uh, th this is a gem that they published uh, last year. It's fantastic. I will have to bump that up a little then. then. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, your latest book, Peter, is called Terminus. Uh, it is – is it the, the fourth book in the Threshold universe? Did I get that right? Technically, I the whole Threshold thing was never intended to be like a book one, book two, book three, book four thing. So, I mean, it is the – fourth book I've written that falls under that umbrella, but I think calling it book four is a little off. I know we had problems because some of the, the marketing people really wanted to call dead moon book three. Yeah. And I was like, but it's not a book three. It's just another book written in that universe. And if you tell everyone it's book three, they're going to get annoyed. And some people, <laughs> guess what? Some people got annoyed. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I, I apologize greatly, but it's like, but yes, it is the 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 fourth book I have written set in that universe. Well, um, you know, I I can name a couple of other authors who have written, um, books that are um tangentially uh, connected, um, it it seems, or maybe not connected at all to the reader. Yet the author has 
certain elements that they are using across these books, and it makes sense to the author. Um, one day there'll be a reveal to the reader. Um, how do you in in building a connected universe like the Threshold Universe, where like you said, you, you don't have to read these books in order, and if you have not read the other books in the Threshold Universe, you're not going to miss anything. Um, but if you have, you will pick up on little Easter eggs here and there. Um, could could you talk a little bit about the the connectedness of these books? What makes them connected to you, and what benefit does that give to the reader? Well, I think you kind of you hit on a great point that it's. I think if if you want to write something like this, you can't have a lot of, you know. You don't want to hit a point as a reader where it's like, okay, obviously something just happened. Like this is a reference to something. They're talking about something, but I don't know what it is um, because I think that distance is a reader right away. So I always try to make books as standalone as possible. Um, the Easter eggs, then that's sort of what it becomes. It ought to becomes Easter egg stuff, subtle meaning stuff um, because I'm a huge fan of that. I love as a reader, as a, a movie watcher, TV watcher, I love it when they let you figure stuff out. Um, rather than, you know, I, I personally, it feels like to me, and I, it seems like this thing, I don't think we like getting treated like idiots and having, you know, stuff. By the way, this person who we last saw four books back in chapter this, when he was a geneticist, whatever. Um, I like it when people come up to me at cons and said, I got a question. Is the receptionist from the fold the woman who was working in the other cube before? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> um, and that's, I don't know, I... A lot of it I write that way because it's the kind of stuff I like. Um, as far as how do you do it, or how do I do it, I guess, um, one of the key things to remember is like, okay, when I wrote 14, which arguably was sort of the, the first threshold book, um, it was just a book I wrote because I wanted to write it. I honestly thought it was too weird to succeed. Uh, the publisher at the time was a small press, uh, permitted press. The publisher really liked it. He told me, and keep in mind at this point, permitted was like one guy, his his press, finger quotes, um, was like a table in his living room. And he, you know, told me, I really like this. Basically, every book I've really liked that I've taken on does eh. So I didn't think it was going to appeal to anyone. And it was a, a big surprise to me to find out that lots of other people enjoyed this kind of weird, crazy stuff as much as me. And then it became a sort of not so much feeling back, but like for me, just picking up loose threads, picking up this and just sort of spreading out into that world and thinking, you know, what else would have happened? Um, the Fold, which is arguably book two in all this, was... Or, or the second book, I should say. Now I'm saying book two. They got me doing it. Uh, the, the second book was actually the book, if you remember a couple minutes ago when I was talking, that I had finished up this book, The Suffering Map, and then started another book, which I put aside to write X Heroes. Well, that other book was a thing called Mouth, uh, which actually came off a, a sh longer short story I had written in college about these people who are trying to make a dimensional gateway, um, which can basically double as like a teleportation thing. Step through here, come out there. Um, and I had finished up, let's see, I had done the first four X Heroes books and I was trying to come up with something else. Like, what am I gonna do next, what am I gonna do next? And I actually remember I was driving home from a Christmas party um, and it suddenly struck me that that book mouth a lot of the elements in it would fit very well in the same universe as 14 that it wouldn't be hard to envision some of these things and so 
I wrote it in that sense and then just figured and talking with the editor on it. Like he, my editor didn't want a second book. Like he didn't want a sequel book. Um, partly because it was with a different publisher, you know, and we don't want to pick up book two because book two never sells as good as book one. So there was the thing that, okay, this has to be its own separate standalone thing. But I still wanted to like pepper stuff in so that if people had read that other book, they'd have those little moments of going like, oh, oh, I get it. Like, Weird, weird film aside. You ever seen the movie Dead Again? Kenneth Branagh. Um, there's that wonderful moment in it when he goes to talk to the old reporter. And the old reporter is talking, oh, you know, the only two people still I was the little kid and his mom. And, all, you know, and you have this wonderful moment. I think it is phenomenal filmmaking that Kenneth Branagh's character on screen figures it out like this is timed so perfectly like one second before the audience does like he puts it together so there's this whole thing of i remember watching it and just i was saw it in a theater and the collective gasp in the theater as like everybody and kenneth Branagh on screen all realize what this means at once and i thought what an amazing moment if you can if you can give people a moment like that, that they're reading through and hit something and go, oh, or the, you know, we have that extra bit of knowledge that we've carried over from another book that makes this, this is a, a cool moment, a creepy moment, whatever, but we have the moment that, the knowledge that makes it that extra 10%, 20%, even creepier because we know this. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm flailing again. I'm very sorry. I, <laughs> you're, I should you're have talking. warned you about this ahead of time. I will ramble a lot if you give. Me... <laughs> well, you know the the opposite of uh, having someone ramble is someone that gives one sentence answers, and nobody yeah. wants that. I promise. Um, Terminus is the new book. Um, it, narrated as uh, as all of the um, the Threshold Universe books are by Ray Porter. Um, what a fantastic relationship it seems to us that you and Ray Porter have. Um, I love the way he narrates your books and it seems like you guys have a real, um, cohesion between writer and narrator. Um, do, do you think differently about books knowing that these books are going to be performed, uh, as you know, but because writing has changed, um, audio books while having been around for a while, um, are really coming into uh, maturity and and, and probably yeah. probably one of the the greatest growth markets right now is, is, is audiobooks. Um, as a writer, how do you feel about audiobooks and does it change your process? I I have no problem with audiobooks. I know there are people who who despise them for just different weird personal reasons. Um, shh, don't tell Audible. They're probably not my preferred method of taking a book in. I'm, I'm still just very much a flop, you know, in the library, in my big comfy chair with pages. Um, but I like audiobooks. I mean, I've listened to a bunch. Um, I listen to my own stuff. I am very fortunate that Audible just sort of randomly hooked me up with Ray Porter at one point. Um, hooked up is probably the wrong way to put that. And then... <laughs> um, <laughs> And we just clicked, you know, that the way he likes to perform and the way I like to write, the, our two styles just go together very, very well. Um, and he's, he's told me this. He loves narrating my books. I've actually gotten to see him. Uh, I was actually there for like four chapters of Terminus being recorded. And it was, it was fascinating watching him. Um, Normally, it doesn't make much of a difference to me, personally. Um, like when I wrote uh, Paradox Bound, I wrote Paradox Bound to be a book, and I did not think about format much at all. Um, but Dead Moon and Terminus were Audible exclusives. Audible paid to have those books themselves. Um, and so I became a little more conscious with those 
that they were being written for this format. And working with my editor at Audible, I did become aware of like a lot of, I don't want to say habits, but just a lot of aspects of writing that can work on the page. But when someone is reciting them to you, these words to you, they, there is that shift and, and becoming much more aware of this isn't going to be seen. This is going to be heard. Um, one of the best examples I can think of of this is when I started out, uh, I was a big believer that to be interesting, you should never use the same dialogue descriptor. So, yes, some char- very few characters would say, one or two, but some would shout, some would m- whisper, some would mutter, some would grumble, some would glower, some would yell, some would, you know, on and on. I basically felt that if you used the same descriptor twice on the same page, you were failing as a writer. And very early on, like, well, not very early on, but, uh, God, I guess this would have been maybe like 16, 17 years ago now. Um, I was at a conference and I actually got to sit down and get like a mini critique from, uh, Pat Labrudo, who's a very famous editor who's worked in a lot, at a lot of publishing houses and a lot of magazines. And he looked through the first five pages of the book I was working on, The Suffering Map, actually, and literally just took his pen and went like, (laughs) and the piece of advice he gave me was, look, set is invisible. No one is going to register set on a page. They'll gloss over it. They won't see it. Um, It's the most basic piece of little connective tissue. So stop drawing attention to yourself. Be invisible. Let us tell the story. And that has been my big firm belief for pretty much since then until I started working with audiobooks. And one of the things my editor there pointed out is yes, normally it's invisible, but now people are hearing it. It's not on the page anymore. And I've had one or two people mention it to me as like temper tantrum reasons why they hate audiobooks. And I'm like, well, this isn't, this is just a, a, a general thing, but Yes, I can see where if you're reading an audiobook, it gets really annoying to keep hearing he said, she said, he said, she said, Bob said, he said, she said, said Bob. But, you know, again and again and again. And so audiobooks, I don't think it's so much that it has changed that I'm writing differently for the format, but it has made me much more conscious of how to be a better writer for all formats. Does that make sense that that I I have become aware of, okay, how can I make this the the dialogue attribution more apparent in more subtle ways? So I'm not just saying he said, she said, he said, she said again and again and again. You know, how how often one of the things that's made me very aware of and I'm a big and I just over these past two books, I think here's my helpful hint. I think most of us perceive dialogue as a binary thing. It's a conversation. Right now, it's a conversation between Peter and Hank. I talk, you talk. I talk, you talk. To the point that even if someone was reading a transcript of this, they wouldn't need headers on it. Because after a while, they'll know that the person who talks after me is you. The person who talks after you is me. And we only would need to drop in a reminder what every five or six exchanges of who's who. So I've actually gotten very big on using even less dialogue descriptors and just accepting that people are going to get this. And I only need it when I want to toss in a little reminder now. And then if like something's happened, you know, if we, if you and I are talking and it's Hank, Peter, Hank, Peter, Hank, Peter, all right, let's pause. I'm going to run and go grab a can of Pepsi. You want anything? No. Okay. Okay, we're back. Probably mention who's back right now. <laughs> you know? And then we can just go back into you, me, you, me, you, me. Um, maybe a third person or fourth person comes in. And now, okay, it's getting a little tricky. But it, it's just writing for audiobooks has made me 
I think a, a better, tighter writer in that sense that I'm realizing what, what do I really need? What do I not need? What is the word that jumps to mind is clutter, but that sounds a little more negative. Um, but you know, what, what is stuff that's just accumulating there out of force of habit from the past, you know, 15, 16 years of doing this that I think, I think it's something we don't talk about a lot that we all develop our own little weird habits and idiosyncrasies about how things should be written. And I think one of the, the best things you can do as a writer is be open to the fact of, huh, I, I still have things to learn. I have, you know, there are new ways to do things, different ways to do things. I should be aware of these different formats and how, it, you know, it isn't just an, an instant across format appeal. Um, pro- probably a great way to think of it is translations. That I have a couple of friends who write like bizarro comedy spoof things. And you can put in a lot of funny references. You can put in a lot of wordplay. You can put in a lot of this, which works in English. You know, and a lot of these references make sense to people in the United States. But if my book gets picked up and I get a German translation or a Chinese translation or a Thai translation, you know, suddenly a lot of the wordplay and stuff doesn't make sense suddenly the, you know, that funny reference falls flat. So that's what I think it is, is is sort of constantly trying to be aware of once this switches, it will be something different. And the more I can think of, the more I can, I don't know, be aware, be opening. Translation might not have been the best. Everyone forget that last last example I gave. (laughs) Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if one thing is for sure it, is that audiobooks are reminding a lot of us that uh, to bone up on your chops and and to look at ways that that you've become uh, lazy is the wrong word, but uh, you take things for granted. Yeah. Yeah. The newest book is called Terminus. Uh, It's out, uh, available everywhere now. Um, I uh, have listened to the Audible narration by Ray Porter because uh, I've listened to all of your books narrated by Ray Porter, and I love them. And um, I also have them on my Kindle, but uh, I I love the the Audible version of it. And so, sue me. Um, Anyway, uh, we'll put links to all of those in the show notes. Uh, Peter, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff you do. I know that you write a fantastic blog. Um, where can people find you online and, and dig into all the great stuff that you do? Um, I'm, I lucked out somehow. And even though I got into this sort of very late internet wise, um, Peter Kleins was open for everything. So I am Peter Kleins on Twitter. I'm Peter Kleins on Instagram. I'm Peter uh, where you can find links to the blog. You can, uh, that's kind of it. I, I have no idea how I got that lucky. Because so, <laughs> I also know there's like a lawyer of Peter Klein's in Manhattan, and apparently he didn't grab anything. So, And uh, at peterkleins.com, there's a link to the blog. Uh, if they click on that, it will actually take them over to Blogger, where yeah. uh, you are thoth-amon.blogspot.com. Uh, yes, the- um, the blog is super old. I started it years and years and years and years ago. Um, and to be terribly honest, I'm just too lazy to migrate it <laughs> to my own website. <laughs> well, it's perfect. Just go to peterkleins.com. There's a link to it at the top. Click it, and you're there. It's it's uh, it's no trouble at all. And I'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Um, Peter, this has been so much fun talking. Um, we'll send everyone to see you and to pick up the new book. Um, thank you for taking time to come on the show today. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world settings safe and organized 
helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too.